Um, for the sake of this podcast, and you can fill in the other ones you don't, uh, I don't mention, but give them an argument, uh, the show. People should go, be f if they're not familiar with, they should familiarize themselves with. Uh, and also, uh, author of uh, Give Them an Argument, the book, and uh, most recently, Canceling Comedians While the World Burns. Uh, and then, what's the uh, subtitle do we got, Ben? Uh, critique of the Contemporary Left. Yes, and uh, and which uh, I, I read uh, on Wednesday evening, I think you did a great job of putting things into proportion. Um, it struck me as sort of like part two of give them an argument. Like, it's like, yeah, yeah. Ser like seriously, guys, give them an argument. Um, and there, I will just say up front that there are certain parts of the cancel culture debate where I, I, I am set, um, sympathetic to maybe a, a Nathan Robinson approach to it. Um, but the main, the title of the book, I think is well chosen because it's something that I... <laughs> I've literally gone through this exact thing. Um, a majority report I had a bunch of people several years ago, um, to the point where it became a mild, like uh, a minor thing where people had to like IM and stuff and call in about for a couple of days. That I said, Louis, I don't think whether Louis C.K. plays a Kansas City comedy club is something we should really devote a whole bunch of our time on. And people really got upset uh, at me uh, towards that. So. Um, with all that said, uh, yeah, talk about what you're emphasizing with this book and why you think it's important. Because I do think, like, look, I, I am a person that has uh, a little less patience with certain uh, arguments in this genre. But I think, again, I think you've uh, put it proportionally very well. I appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, I guess the other things I'd, I'd uh, add to uh, – yeah, I guess really the only other thing I'd add to the bio is uh, – Jacobus, Jacobin columnist, because I'm always telling people that like if I uh, like if I get hit by a truck or something tomorrow, like what I want on my tombstone is Ben Burgess, lo loving husband, you know, son, brother, uh, was on the masthead at Jacobin. So uh, very well, yes. Uh, but uh, but yeah. Uh, so I uh, I like what you said about how it was. I was kind of a sequel to uh, to the first book because. Uh, in fact, I actually find this kind of funny that like, I think some people who, who aren't crazy about the fact that I did the second book, um, like seem to see some sort of like change there. <laughs> and I, I, I mean, do you read the first one? Cause like I said, all this stuff, I just, you know, like it wasn't the emphasis, but I did say all of it. Uh, and, and this is the second book is an attempt to sort of do a deeper dive on, on the stuff. I kind of say, you know, to set up the, uh, to set up the first book. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm very concerned in uh, in both cases about a a set of behaviors, a set of attitudes, ways of doing things uh, that I think uh, undermine uh, the uh, the left's effectiveness. Uh, so I'm, you know, with your, you know, with your example about, you know, Louis, uh, you know, Louis C.K. Uh, the the point isn't, you know, and and I think I I, I get where this comes from because I, I think this is some of what's animating that you know, Nathan Robinson kind of perspective that, you know, that you mentioned, like, okay, well, hold on. We live in a world where uh, imperialist wars exist, police violence exists, uh, you know, poverty wages exist, uh, you know, and so if your reason for not liking people act in this way is that you're concerned, you know, for Louis C.K., you know, that you're, that, you know, that you always, is Louis going to be okay? You know, then, then I, I, I get it, right? You know, like, like, like I, I, I get the sort of pushback against that. Uh, my concern is different. I think uh, that it's not that I don't think that there are any harms that ever come from this stuff. I think there are. I mean, we talked about that a little bit last time I was I was, I was on the show, and I, I do think there is kind of a performative contradiction sometimes in the attitudes of people who, in lots of other contexts, think that psychological harms are very real harms. Uh, but in in just this one, right? They say, "Oh, whatever, log off, you'll be fine." Uh, but uh, but I agree. That like as far as harms go, I mean these are very far down the list. My concern instead uh, is with making the left look like overgrown hall monitors uh, in a way that makes us vastly less appealing to most of the people that we need to win over. Yes, and that, that's what I like, as I think it is the it's the posture that's the most putting. Like irrespective of the content of any one of these fights, really, that people might come down on a separate side of, it's just not a good like. Because I'm somebody who likes. Like Joe Rogan is a great example yeah. that always comes up, right? Like, mm -hmm. and I I have cousins who like are Joe Rogan guys, and the if it was just like telling him, hey, don't 
watch that it's gonna like make you bad or something like that that's just i just know like that's gonna reflect on me even though i'm their cousin like that's just not what people respond well to whereas like mm-hmm. if you can actually like uh like you say i guess give the argument uh, that is something to latch onto that's real um so they don't feel like they're being managed basically yeah, I think that's I think that's exactly right. Uh, and and the Rogan case I think is a really telling one because, um, you know, because because Rogan obviously is is all over the place. You know, he he says things that uh, he said things that I loved. In most cases, the reason I know he said them is that uh, there were majority report clips about them, uh, and uh, and he's he's he said things that I've absolutely hated. You know, and including mm-hmm. some very recent things, uh, but. Ultimately, you know, he's he's a little all over the place. You know, he he doesn't really have a, a coherent political perspective. Uh, but guess what? Neither do your neighbors. You know, neither do well, not you guys, but you know, your in the larger sense, your coworkers. You know, <laughs> like you know, neither do most people because most people aren't weird political obsessives like us. You know, mm-hmm. mo- you know, most people have political instincts, they have political reactions to things, but they haven't really thought about it enough for those to cohere into internally consistent worldview. I think it's the same with, uh, with, with Rogan. I mean, that like, if you, I mean, sure, he spent 10,000 hours interviewing political guests because he's been on the air for a million hours, but like, it's, it's nothing compared to the number of martial artists and uh, drug gurus and comedians and actors, you know, that he's, uh, that, that he's, he's interviewed. And ultimately he's more interested in, you know, psychedelics and conspiracy theories and mixed martial arts and a thousand other subjects uh, that he has in, in, in politics. Uh, but what bothers me is the fixation on is Joe Rogan a good person mm-hmm. or a bad person, uh, which are, always reminds me of that Adolf Reed line about how this is just too Protestant a way of, of approaching politics. Mm-hmm. It's all about who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. And it particularly bothers me because last year when this, this came up in a really important context, uh, when Rogan endorsed Bernie just before the Iowa caucus, um, there was all this controversy about whether it's okay that Bernie had accepted so the support of this terrible person and, you know, a lot of that was ginned up by bad faith actors and supporters of other candidates. But, you know, I, I saw way too many people with that Democratic Socialist red rose emoji in their Twitter handles who were, who were going along with that. And I think that does speak to some of the counterproductive moralism that I'm trying to push back against in the book. Yeah. And I just wanted to, to bring, bring it up again, because it's sort of in the news, because, you know, Joe Rogan went on his show and is now like, you know, doing vaccine skeptic stuff. And almost immediately you started to see people on, on Twitter being like, yeah, this is exactly why uh, we tried to warn Bernie, uh, you know, and especially now they feel vindicated because they're like, because he didn't win. Like it wasn't enough to, to, to get him victory. Yeah. And like, I, I think, and I want to get into the culture stuff, like the culture of the left, maybe, which might be a problem <laughs> of a term, but um, in a second, but um, I, I think that your emphasis here, because a lot of people, when they hear cancel culture, they immediately go into like a panic, like they know their their response, right? There's the idiots like the the Prager, you know, yeah, Dennis yeah. Prager and Adam Carolla, you know, they like there's a whole right wing cottage industry about getting worked up about uh, cancel culture. And then there's a whole like left wing group that just immediately hears that and they like put their fingers in their ears and say it doesn't exist and you know there's some reason for the confusion why so many people do different things with it because it's this very slippery term Mm -hmm. but you know and i know you talk you touch on a lot of things so i don't want to say your book is limited but in this joe rogan example right we're talking about a question that a political movement is having in the midst of an important campaign about whether or not they should take an endorsement from somebody who's going to tell all their people that this is the way to go right this is the campaign to support on the basis of if we litigate this guy's entire like life and all of his political opinions and social opinions, is he good or bad, right? And yeah. then this might not be the best way to try to build mass politics, not because we're trying to be tolerant necessarily of like bigoted behavior or thing like that, but because it's a very absurd way to engage with people, right? That, you know, everybody, you go into conversation and there's this moment where we decide, okay, you're A-OK or you are out of here. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's just uh, that's 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 just right. And the thing that most disturbs me about it is that I think that it shows a kind of mission creep in um, what is what is left politics for. Right? What's what's the uh, what's the point? Uh, because if you think that the the purpose of political engagement is to try to uh, to change the world to you know to try to alter material you know material reality uh then this is a then like somebody like rogan endorsing birdie that's that's an unambiguous good thing uh because especially because i mean i would i would understand the objection if there'd been some sort of process of negotiation where like bernie had to drop certain points from his platform in exchange for this <laughs> so that's a good right point. it was costless <laughs> yeah it's costless so in exchange for nothing <laughs> uh the most popular podcaster in the world with an enormous audience of people who it doesn't even go without saying that they're going to vote for Democrats necessarily uh, is uh, is supporting you uh, in a in a crucial uh, in a crucial moment. And by the way, it was also proof of concept for one of the big things that Bernie that Bernie was pushing, which is that uh, he could get people to vote for him who wouldn't even necessarily be mm-hmm. counted on to vote for any Democrat who's nominated. Uh, and and this this is an unambiguous good thing, uh, because the the whole point, like certainly especially in the context of an election, I mean that really simplifies things. Like the purpose of an election, you know, of participation in election is to get more people to vote for you than for the other guy, so so you win. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and it just seems to me that if you still object at that point, uh, then you're doing something else. Uh, and and I worry that the something else is more about. Uh, a symbolic display of of moral commitment, uh, you know, than uh, than trying to uh, trying to achieve a different uh, a different kind of society. And and I and I also think there is a really bad overlap, right? I mean, like whatever you want to call it, like the uh, the sort of cancely trends in in the larger culture. I agree, the phrase cancel culture is an imperfect you know label for it, and especially in the last several months. Uh, the discourse about it has gotten like really, really stupid, but, uh, but also whatever you want to call it, there are certain trends towards um, mutual surveillance, uh, hair trigger denunciation, trying mm-hmm. to get people fired that are a big thing that like that I, I, I would argue is just kind of a disease of neoliberalism. It impacts the whole political spectrum. Uh, but I also worry that it has a particularly bad effect on what I care the most about, which is the left, mm-hmm. uh, because the left has been like wandering around in the desert in total exile from any kind of real power uh, for so long that I think a lot of people have become accustomed to thinking of politics in that symbolic protest kind of way. And you put that together with the fact that for all of these larger reasons that we can talk about, you know, having to do with the fact that we live in a neoliberal hellscape where people can get fired over nothing, with the fact that we live in a society where people are incredibly atomized, they often feel most connected to other people online, uh, with the fact that the social media companies themselves, like we were talking about when I was on last time, really uh, incentivize our worst behavior. You put that all t- all together with the with the particular pathologies of the left, you know, from the last several decades. And, and it becomes like a horrible mess. And, and I really worry that we end up acting in ways that are going to make most people whose material interests would align from our program not really want to have much to do with us. Like we talked about with Kale a few weeks ago. Or I can't remember exactly what it was. It might have been last week for all I remember. But um, like people don't aren't engaged in politics all that often. And if, yeah, the main engagement is like you're going to what's popular in culture and then presenting yourself as, like you said, a hall monitor, it's bad. Like the thing with Rogan, I remember joking with Michael about how like it'd be one thing if Bernie made a deal saying you can be czar of uh, high school sports. Uh, and then it'd be like, yes, Bernie, what the fuck are you doing with this but literally it, they just used him saying something about them for propaganda value and i would say like that engagement uh rogan apologized for his vaccine stuff like i would say almost like and 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 during that campaign he was i mean look he still says stuff that is completely like risible but he, i honestly think it probably had like, him having that kind of spotlight in the context of a presidential campaign probably kept him a little bit more honest than he was generally maybe, maybe that's a bit too much to say but i think the idea that it in impo- or the worst parts of Joe Rogan is just not not true. But 
Yeah, no, I, I think that's like 100% right. I, the Bernie example, I think, is really clear there, too, um, where it's like we're not actually having conversations about structural shifts on the Bernie Sanders platform or campaign or even like I'm like Bernie's not giving anything up for this. He's just bringing more people in. And if you're trying to do mass politics, that should be the goal. Yeah, but, I mean, and, and I would also point out that like even if and, and I actually think with in the in the Rogan case, a lot of this is a little exaggerated, but, uh, but even, even when you're talking about people who do have like really bad views, uh, I, I guess the question I would raise is what's the strategy for trying to get them to evolve in a better direction. That's more likely to, uh, to succeed. Uh, is, well, is it sort of denouncing them and, and having nothing to do with them or is it trying to appeal to them on the issues they can be appealed to work together with them in the common project and hope that, that doing that, you know, moves them, you know, kind of as, as they go, which I would argue is kind of, is the history of the American labor movement at its best. Yep. I would say like with regards to professional, like racists though, like you're talking like the great clip we all, we all love is Hitch and Stock into Mets, the Metzgers um, and him having to get his dad like that. that that's because like, I, I, I don't know if it, this is just for, for people who are familiar with that. He like interviewed a neo-Nazi. And and he and this neo Nazi does like it's Christopher Hitchens versus this neo Nazi and the Nazi does so bad that Daddy calls in like half <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> to like help his boy out because Chris <laughs> Hitchens is just destroying him. Yeah, and it's like I think that that kind of conflict is good. And um, I don't know. Uh, I I want to talk about the Mark Fisher at Russell Brand stuff, but is there anything you guys want to say before we get to that? Uh, for for the record, I don't think that the uh, the Metzgers can be part of any sort of socialist coalition. I <laughs> would not mean to imply that you did. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask though before we got to the Fisher stuff, and this might sort of blend in well, um, because it's this book. Once you announce the title, like there was immediate yeah. like frustr you know, people immediately freaked out before reading the book, and I don't like for people who want to read about Ben's thoughts on comedy and, and cancel culture. Um, there's a lot of it in there, but he's also really hitting at problems within the left and the left movement too. It's a, it's a very encompassing book of a lot of tendencies that I think at least is my interpretation of the book. It's like really show their like worst aspects in what we're calling cancel culture of this kind of like online activity. Um, but there are a lot of kind of deficiencies with strategy and how people think about politics and things like that. But anyways, that put, put that all aside for a second. I wanted to pose this challenge to you, Ben. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, I won't do devil's advocate, but um, but there are folks out there who, when they hear like a criticism of cancel culture, what they feel is this is saying that like, oh, we should give everybody pass to, you know, espouse really transphobic beliefs, espouse racist beliefs, and we shouldn't engage with them or anything like that. Um, and, you know, just let it be because it makes us look bad and it's not cool or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, which I know is not necessarily your position, but if you don't do, use the tactic of the online mob to criticize powerful people who say bad things um, or who use their platform to, you know, amplify certain voices. How, how is this a retreat from that kind of conversation of holding people accountable? Um, or are you talking about something different? Yeah, I, I guess what I would really most question in all of that uh, is what it means to uh, to hold powerful people accountable. Like, what would actually count uh, as 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 holding uh, as holding people accountable? Uh, which I mean, it might sound pedantic, but I, I think it's a I think it's an important distinction you mm -hmm. know, because uh, what I would like right would be something that I think would involve a lot of. Uh, holding powerful people accountable like I, I would I would like the the left to take power so then like they're all, like among other things that long list of American officials would be like standing trial for war crimes for example right I mean like that's that's something that I would like that would definitely count as uh, as holding people accountable uh, oftentimes I think that uh, in a way we, we sort of end up being satisfied by this a very weird idea of, uh, of holding people accountable. Mm. Uh, which is that like we just sort of have that cathartic satisfaction of of yelling at them and 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 whatever i mean there are people i'm certainly not going to object too hard to anybody yelling at you know like like if uh um you know back in like a couple of years ago when uh, there were all these trump officials 
uh, who, uh, who were responsible for child separation, who were being like yelled at when they went to Mexican restaurants and stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm all for that, you know, like if you, if you see the, uh, the head of the Department of Homeland Security uh, at a restaurant, you know, and, and, and you want to tell him to go fuck himself, like go nuts, you know, like let's, let's do that, you know, but mm. Um, it's also not going to win socialism. Um, I mean, it's, I it's, it's also not going to win socialism, right? right? And 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 it's it's something that I, and I worry about being. Uh, I worry about letting ourselves uh, like get sucked into this kind of pseudo politics uh, where we're where we're really most concerned with giving vent to certain feelings or making certain kinds of symbolic statements rather than. Uh, achieving anything concrete and especially when uh, because one thing that should be a key difference between leftism and liberalism uh, is that we understand that the main problem with the society that we're living in is not that there are individual bad people uh, Mm -hmm. who have bad thoughts in their heads Uh, it's that you know structures uh, and systems uh, that uh, that that exist are are bad and and need to be changed Uh, and of course, you know, you know, we, I don't want to just vague that up, right? You know, like like Matt was talking about earlier, you know, before I came on about Democrats, uh, you know, but I, I think that you know, capitalism, you know, imperialism, those those structures, and the thing is, the easiest thing in the world uh, for the other side to do when they're feeling threatened is just cut loose individual spokesmen, right? Say, oh hey, oh this, you think this guy's problematic? No problem. Right. You know, like, like we've, we've, we've got a hundred more, you know, where, uh, where, right. where he comes from. Yeah. My, my like uh, Milo's book being canceled didn't turn him into a martyr, but it also didn't change any of the ferocity of reaction that he was representing briefly. <laughs> yeah. I would say real briefly at the Milo point, I think that's an interesting case because sometimes because memories are very short, uh, we like to tell ourselves that we somehow ended Milo's career, you know, that, that the left did that, that like, I would say, you know, we deplatformed him until he didn't go away. It's like, no, Milo's career was built on attempts to deplatform him. Uh, it ended because he said something that offended his conservative backers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. 